Hello, ransomware is the single biggest threat to healthcare right now. And if you don't know what it is, and your organization isn't doing anything to protect yourself from it, then you might as well be driving on the highway without seatbelts. But don't worry, because today we're going to be talking about what ransomware is, how it could seriously impact your organization, and more importantly, what you can do to reduce the risk and mitigate the damage that ransomware could have on your organization. So, really quick, my name is uh, Jerry Ozier. I was asked by SCMGMA to give this talk, but this talk will be publicly available, and I really, really think it's uh, a good intended audience would be both technical and non-technical people that work within the healthcare space um, and are responsible for protecting the assets. Uh, you know, so at smaller businesses, people wear multiple hats, and that could be you. So. Uh, really quick, um, my name is Jerry Ozier, and I am a managing partner at Coastal Information Security Group, which is a security advisory, kind of a cybersecurity expert consultancy um, that helps small businesses primarily, um, re really within the state of South Carolina. I do have a PhD in cyber operations, uh, which gives me kind of that academic perspective and background. And if you want to connect with me afterwards and discuss anything, or get follow-up or clarification questions, what have you, um, my contact information is provided right there. So let's get into it. So today, the two things that I want you to really get out of this talk is I want you to understand how ransomware can be catastrophic. I'm talking end your business bad, okay? It can, it can be, and it, it's actually not that uncommon. And I want you to understand what you can do. I'm going to provide you like a dozen different things on how to protect your business. Do you have to do all a dozen? It would, it would help. It wouldn't hurt. But if you only can do a couple, either because of budget, resources, time, uh, infrastructure, etc., then that's fine. And you're still reducing the risk to some degree. So th those are what you're going to get out of this talk. Uh, but first, I did mention that this talk's audience is intended to be both technical and non-technical, but I want to emphasize uh, the non-technical audience because I, I want this content and this topic, it is so important um, for everybody to kind of know about ransomware and how it can impact healthcare that I don't, I don't want it to be inaccessible to non-technical background people. So if you're you know, clinical fo focused, if you're business operation focused, um, take heart that this talk is going to be informative and uh, completely appropriate uh, for, for this audience, okay? So let's, let's dig. Now, it can be catastrophic. I, I mentioned that before. This is uh, Wood Ranch Medical out of Simi Valley, California, and they suffered a ransomware attack. And you can see this is what happens when you go to their website, woodranchmedical.com. We will be closing our practice on December 17th because we are victims of ransomware. This business literally went out of business. This is not an isolated incident. You hear about ransomware attacks all the time. Healthcare specifically is targeted uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, one, because um, if you think about it, it's a patient safety issue, right? If, if, a, if a threat actor brings your machine down, it, you know, like it could be a patient safety thing. Availability is critical and the bad guys know this. So just know that this is not uh, fictitious. I'm not making it up. You can go out of business. So what is ransomware? Let's define it. Ransomware is a form of malware, so it's malicious software. It's intentionally written software to be bad that encrypts a victim's files. And we're going to go in and kind of uh, dig into what that actually means. But essentially what it is is it makes your files encrypted and inaccessible. If you've ever tried to open an attachment that was encrypted and you had to put a little password in or something like that, that's essentially what it is. But the problem is you don't know the password and the bad guys will sell it to you. That's why it's called ransomware. Now the traditional ransomware model, and this is, you know, I, I want to say like 2011, 2012, it started coming onto the scene, is exactly what I said. They'll run their software on your computer or your network attached storage devices, encrypt it, and in exchange for money, uh, typically in a you know a cryptocurrency format, so you can't track them down. Um, they, they'll you know like Bitcoin, they'll they'll charge you money. Now it started off as like three four hundred bucks, 
Um, it ranges wildly now. You can get, um, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Like some ransomware actors will actually like case a joint, if you will. And uh, they'll know, they'll know like what your annual revenue sales are. So they can actually deduce like what a reasonable, um, they'll know what a reasonable ransom is that you'd be willing to pay. Um, so now there are other, uh, it's evolved over time, so um, excuse me, my my two dogs over here are getting frisky. So um, it has evolved over time, and now uh, because people aren't paying the ransom, quite frankly, uh, for for various reasons, and now the threat actors are saying, okay, fine, well we've got you know we downloaded your data, we have access to it, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to put it on like an underground eBay. And we'll sell it, and you can see the starting price right here is $100,000 with $10,000 increments um, or, or $10,000 uh, deposit for, you know, whatever. But the idea is that they are pressuring you to pay the ransom because if you pay the ransom, they'll bring the auction down. So the bad guys are going to make their money one way or the other, and they don't really care. I, the reason ransomware is so prolific is because A, it's, it's, you know, it's quite successful, and B, Threat actors are making tons of money off of it. I mean, it is a cash cow right now. And if you, oh, you know, follow the money, follow the money. This is why it's so, it's so rampant right now. Also, um, you can see, you know, they, they use other kind of techniques, if you will, in order to um, kind of force your hand or give you panic in order to pay the ransom. This just happened a couple months ago. This is May of 2020 where a law firm in New York City got ransomware and, you know, effectively um, the, the threat actors were saying, you know, pay us whatever, 400000 I think it was, uh, and we'll, we'll give you your data back. And they said, no, we're going to contact the FBI, which, which is a good course of action. And they said, all right, well, we're going to start leaking um, emails and legal docs from celebrities. And I think there was some Donald Trump stuff that got leaked. I think there was a couple... Um, uh, uh, like Lady Gaga and a couple other kind of like celebrity musicians um, that were involved in that. So again, it's all about pressure. They are trying to pressure you into making the payments, right? And I, I believe after they leak these, they, they increase the, uh, ex, um, the ransom as well. Now this is, uh, this is where it gets next level. So ransomware is going well, but it's a lot of work, right? You've got to like find a victim. You've got to successfully um, exploit them. You got to get your ransomware running. You got to get them uh, to pay uh, the, the fine and all this stuff. Well, some of the larger players in the game figured out, well, heck, since so many people want to do ransomware and it's such a successful kind of attack, uh, why don't we create a ransomware as a service model? We'll build out a platform and we'll give you all the encryption software, the malware, the ransomware, uh, we'll handle the transactions as far as like the Bitcoin and all that stuff, the financial pieces of it. And all you have to do is sign up and get the ransomware to load on someone's computer. So think about this for a second. You, you've you basically limited it. So now all they need to do is like get onto the computer and install software. And in some cases, uh, you could, you know, you could self-infect your yourself at your business, say you're disgruntled at work or whatever, you just go ahead and do it. And in exchange, you get 75, 70 percent of the uh, reward, the ransom, the reward, excuse me, the ransom. And the, um, you know, the person providing the platform gets 10 to 30 percent. So this this model, because now you don't have to understand how to do cryptocurrency, you don't have to understand how to run a ransomware service, you just need to be able to drop a piece of software um, you know, I mean, it's a simple, you could email someone and say, Hey, run this, uh, to trick them. And you know, if they do, then there you go. Boom. So this increased the proliferation of ransomware as a, uh, attack. Uh, and that's why it's so rampant right now. So you've got this like explosion of people who effectively don't need to understand how it works. So you've lowered the bar for like technical skill set to be a criminal and, you uh, focus it on healthcare, which has this high availability uh, necessity. And in addition, as we all know, in healthcare, um, you know, machines and systems are fairly expensive. They get FDA certified. So upgrading 
uh, the operating system or handling end of life uh, situations where there's no more patches uh, coming out, um, you, you may not replace that system, which makes it a, vic uh, a, a potential weak uh, spot, a, a chink in the armor, if you will, for these threat actors to get in and deploy this ransomware. So, you know, basically this slide just indicates what I've already said ad nauseum that, um, the, you know, it's, it's, it's a billion dollar business and it's projected to go up higher because, frankly, uh, bad guys are doing well at it. I mean, it sucks to say, but they're doing a good job at it just from their perspective of successfully executing, getting it to load and, um, you know, pressuring people into paying those ransoms. So, you know, here in South Carolina, as I, as I mentioned, um, you know, this talks for the SCM GMA and I work in South Carolina. Um, here's a couple local ones. So it's not like the big players, like, you know, like Baltimore, Atlanta, they both suffered massive ransomware attacks in the last couple of years. Google it. You'll, it'll come right up. Uh, but Horry County, little county here on the, um, uh, in, in Eastern South Carolina, $10,000 ransomware. They're not, you know, a major player, but, you, it, you know, ransomware does not care. It doesn't care if you're a big guy, a little guy. I mean, healthcare gets targeted a lot, but it doesn't matter. You could be a plumber. It doesn't matter. It's all about getting it on there and forcing you to pay. Um, here, another South Carolina county uh, uh, government got um, got ransomware. Right now, like actually, government and uh, municipalities are, are pretty much like the the, the highest targeted um, industry, and then manufacturing, and then and then healthcare. But I mean, healthcare is still getting a healthy amount of attacking, so um, it's no joke. So, what are we doing here? Um, targets healthcare. So, oh. The, if, Okay, sorry, I kind of blew my slide uh, in advance, giving it away. Uh, basically, this just kind of resonates with what I just said, so I'm not going to spend much time on this slide. Um, yep, healthcare increasing in attack. So even though ransomware is increasing um, year over year, and we saw that slide of it, the billion dollar industry and it continuing to increase, as I've mentioned, healthcare um, is such a hot target. Um, and, and like bad guys have figured it out. So like the, the, you know, year over year attacking is increasing. I mean, this one, 350%. I mean, that's excessively high as far as like increase goes. So, um, I, I really just wanted to pull a couple uh, pieces of evidence to demonstrate and document to you that this is a legit threat and the government agrees, the U S government agrees, and they've, they've written papers on it. Um, that healthcare is quite serious. I mean, think about it for a minute. Think about it for a minute. It's not even a patient safety issue, even though that's a major one. Think about this. You're, you're, you go into work on Monday and your systems don't work anymore. Your computer systems, okay? How are you going to bill? How are you going to do scheduling? How are you going to know who's coming in that day for, uh, for uh, an appointment? How are you going to uh, record in their patient record? Uh, you know, I mean, maybe you do a cloud EMR or something. How are you going to access it from your iPhone? So it, it has significant ramifications if you can't use your systems. It, it's, it's devastating. And don't think because you're a small business, oh, Jerry, we've only got, you know, 15, you know, 15 staff and 10 uh, clinical uh, people. You know, we've got office people, we've got nurses, we've got three or four physicians. We're a small player. Uh, it's not. It's not really going to affect us. We'll take our chances. Well, as I mentioned, ransomware doesn't care what size you are or what you're doing. It's all about getting the attack to execute successfully. So you can see, uh, you know, based on this slide, 22% of organizations had to cease operations because of ransomware immediately. I mean, and we'll get into what the the cost is on average a little bit later. But like ransomware isn't. It's not cheap. Even the, like the ransom itself can can um, can can range in like how much the bad guy will uh, will charge you, and, and you can even negotiate with them. But that's a different talk. Um, but it, it, it costs money, and then it costs money for like downtime. Like you're not seeing patients. It costs money 
Uh, if you have to repair computer systems, um, you know, lost revenue, reputational damage. So there are a lot of uh, costs and expenses that your, your business and you suffer uh, because of a cyber attack, including ransomware. So uh, just know that SMBs, uh, small businesses, they get hit. 66% uh, 66 have suffered a breach. You may be watching this right now and have a cold chill because you, you know that you've suffered one or you had a small ransomware outbreak um, at your place or maybe a big one, hopefully not. Uh, but this is legit. Um, and sometimes it can be even worse. So I mentioned a minute ago that you come into work and your whole practice is um, jacked up. Well, back in, I guess this says June of 2018, I think that's when it was, all scripts um, who basically they provide like a cloud-based EMR type um, solution, right? So you're a small business, you don't want to run your own uh, legal medical record out of your office, so you just pay them a monthly fee and do it. So they, all scripts, suffered a ransomware attack. So now all scripts, who's essentially a application solution provider, an IT vendor kind of, they go down. Okay, well, that's terrible for them because they're not servicing their clients, but it's terrible for you. This this was like a big time news story. If you don't remember, go back and check it out. It's interesting. Lots of uh, small practices couldn't, um, I mean, they could take patients, but I mean, they were doing it kind of like ad hoc. If, if, you know, just if a patient showed up that day, you would just assume that they had scheduled an appointment. They weren't able to do, um, you know, they weren't able to do the um, uh, documenting in the medical record, couldn't do billing. I mean, it, it was it was serious. All scripts got it fixed after about a week. Uh, but there was some serious impact and a lot of unhappy uh, medical practices out there. So, you know, even if you do everything right, it's possible that um, your third party uh, gets it wrong. So, uh, excuse me, by the way, my dogs. Um, uh, stop. Okay, so sounds bad, right? Hopefully I've painted this picture accurately, mind you, that ransomware is nasty, nasty business. And this is why I said at the onset, you really need to know what ransomware is so you can do something about it. And if you don't, it's like, oh, gosh. So how does ransomware get you? You know, it's not like, um, you know, it's not like it's any which way but loose, right? So there's there's very well-defined ways that ransomware can get you. The other one you can see is other, and it's it's barely um, registering, right? So the three main ways are RDP compromise, which is remote desktop protocol. So this is like using um, remote desktop. So like if you remote in to your office or into your computer uh, or into your business using Windows remote desktop, this is what that is. And if you can do it from your house without connecting to a VPN or anything, then you really need to listen because that is not good. And that's how this, this attack can um, manifest. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. It'll be interesting. I'm, I'll do a live demo. Then there's email phishing. Now, this one is wildly popular. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time belaboring phishing because it should be well known. But essentially, phishing is getting an email that pretends to be something that it's not. It's usually um, trying to trick you into either clicking on a link, which will take you somewhere, or tricking you to download and run something on your computer. And then the third attack vector from ransomware are software vulnerabilities. And, and this is a little bit less frequent. There are some major um, notable ransomware attacks um, that use this technique. Uh, but you, while you should be aware of this, it's really RDP and email phishing that you really should um, uh, take away from this talk, okay? So phishing, here's a couple examples. The one on the left looks every bit real. This is, this is a fake email, right? Every bit real. Um, it looks like the comes from the FTC, consumer complaint notification, got to get serious. Now, you see this link right here, this HTTPS ftc.gov. Now that, you know, we, we train users um, to look at the hyperlink, right? And this looks legit. Maybe you click on it and it takes you to a page that says, oh, you got to log into your Office 365 account before this will work. Or, oh, you got to log into your Amazon account or, oh, whatever. 
and they're going to steal your um, your credentials at that point. You need to hover over this because even though this says this, the hyperlink that's attached to this underneath it is not this. It takes you to a, a bogus, malicious website. So this is what I'm saying. This is a real fish that can really trick you. Okay, so uh, the other one is, um, like I mentioned, having attachments. You can see this PDF in here. Um, you know, it says attaches a secure PDF, whatever. You got to run this. Um, this will install malware on your computer. I don't know if this was, I just pulled this as an example, so I don't know if this would actually load ransomware on your computer, but the point is they're tricking you into running code on your computer, okay? Which is how ransomware can run on your computer. I mentioned earlier, that's what it does. It runs on your computer and encrypts your computer. And then depending on what variant of ransomware, it'll start looking around your network and encrypting other stuff and just doing some nasty business. So, you know, we'll talk about what to do to protect yourself in the future, but just you need you need to do phishing training uh, for your user population, no doubt. Okay, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, this is an example of software misconfiguration. Again, I, I'm I'm intending to be speaking to uh, an audience that ranges in technical um, experience, but just know that everywhere in your net, like you got a network at work, right? You have a network at work. At some point, you have a piece that points to the internet, right? And this is usually a router, and it's how things come in. It's how you go out to Google and stuff like that. Well, if that piece of hardware is misconfigured or it's got open, you know, it's got open listening ports, you, you don't have to really understand too much. Just know that you need to patch it, and you need to make sure that it's hardened, which means that only services that are required to be on are on, and they're properly secured, and the people who have access to it are appropriate, and they have a strong passwords and stuff. Again, this one is not nearly as prevalent as RDP and email, uh, but you do need to know about it and you do need to account for it in your risk mitigation approach. Okay. Now, the big, the granddaddy, the, the grand poobah here, RDP. Okay. So this is what I was talking about before. If you have a box, a Windows machine, a server, a laptop, a desktop, whatever, that's on your network and you intentionally have it exposed to the internet, um, which is, you know, completely possible, various ways to do it, but, and sometimes there's a good reason, not, not to have RDP exposed, but to have a Windows box exposed to the internet. So, what happens is, the attacker scans the internet, finds a bunch of open RDPs, then attacks it. Sometimes they can guess the credentials. Sometimes they got the credentials because they tricked you earlier with that phishing email. Sometimes they can um, exploit the, the the RDP or the Windows box um, because there's an exploit out there, right? Um, and, and then they get in and now they're on your network, on a box, and at that point they could, I mean, they could ransomware that, but it, let's be honest, if you're an attacker and you just broke in, effectively, if you just broke into the house of your business, you're not gonna just like spray the, the front foyer. No, you're gonna then start exploring the business, exploring the house, exploring the network, really looking for resources, trying to find, you know, the crown jewels, we call it, or the gold mine, right? Where is your file uh, storage area, right? Like, do you have a central file repository? Do you have an EMR on, on premise? And where's the database for that? They want to find those things. So when they ransomware you, it is incredibly painful and you want to pay the ransom. If they just like, Ransomware your web server on the like your front your front foyer to use this house analogy. It's not really going to be painful, but if they mess up your whole business, then they win, and you lose, and it sucks. So this is why we don't want RDP exposed to the internet, uh, really at all. So um, okay, so live demo. Let's let's take a minute just because I really want to drive home this point. So this is called Shodan. Okay, Shodan.io, and, and you don't need to do this, uh, you just got to watch. If you are technical or you are interested in learning more, go ahead and check out Shodan.io. But what you need to know is it's basically, um, it's like Google. It searches the internet and, and caches things and, and queries it and, and, and makes an inventory of all this stuff. But it's looking for systems and it's identifying them. So RDP, that Windows Remote Desktop, it's how you remote in from your machine at home or at Starbucks or at the hotel. It's how you remote in 
to your organization and into that Windows box. You might even hire an IT person to manage your IT stuff, and this is how they get in. You should ask them, are, you, are we doing Microsoft Remote Desktop? That's what you need to ask them. The, the, the remote desktop runs on port 3389. You don't really need to understand how ports and, and, and sockets and that, all that stuff works. You just need to know that that web server or that server is actively listening for the phone to ring and it's expecting the phone to ring on, on this port 3389, which is why I've put it in showed it. Now, I've, I've restricted this to the United States, South Carolina, and I'm going to just do Charleston because I live in Charleston. Uh, and this talk is really intended for people of the state of South Carolina, but I just want to show you what I'm going to do. Wait, hold on. I want to do uh, in has screenshot. Yeah. So check this out. This is this is right now. It's what is this? It's July 13th at 530 p.m. OK, these are machines that are actively exposed to the Internet waiting for an RDP connection. Now, remember what I said before, like clf.local slash administrator. I have no idea what where this box is. Um, I mean, I know it's in Charleston, but I don't know what business this is or whose it is. Um, and they have a password here, right? So it's not like I can just walk through uh, their their front door. Uh, but if I've, if I've harvested credentials for this group, I mean, I might Google CLF Charleston see if that pulls up some names. I mean, you'll, you'll do some open source intelligence data gathering, but um, you might be able to guess it. You might be able to give it to them. And like I said before, maybe you encounter um, a machine that has like a known vulnerability. So like these are Windows Server 2008 R2, which are still technically supported by Microsoft, meaning they, they release patches. But uh, Windows 7 Professional this is not um, supported. This actually went end of life on January 20th of 2020. And you can see this says, you know, sbg-eeg.com. Okay, so now we have a website. We could go look like um, we could go see if there's a known exploit for Windows 7, uh, RDP. The, the point I'm making is the ch like think back to what I said before. Ransomware as a service is, is one way to go about it, right? And all you need to do is get onto a machine and drop ransomware. You don't need to understand the infrastructure, the platform, the code, the, how to get the money in and out. Like there's services that will do that for you, you know, threat actor. And all you gotta do is find this. And there's, a, there's this like Google thing that helps you find it. So like the level, the barrier to entry for ransomware isn't that high right now. And this is part of the problem of why it's, prolific and, and just crazy. Okay, so that was just a quick example to kind of demonstrate that. Let's get back to the talk. So this is one that I pulled uh, in preparation for the talk. Uh, this this one here is in, um, I believe this was in South Carolina. Yeah, so this is, this, is a, this is an entity in South Carolina, but what I wanted to pull up is they're running Windows Server 2003 for small business server. This software went end of life a, a long time ago, right? It's 2020, 17 years old. Okay, so don't, don't get overwhelmed by this, but this is, this is what I wanted to show you is this is a tool called Metasploit that's really, really well known within the information security community, both, you know, good guys and bad guys. And this tool is designed right here, Vulnerable Machines, our Windows Server 2003. And this, you just point it at the IP address and type the word exploit. And that's it. You're done. You're in. You don't need to know the username. You don't need to know the password. You don't need to know anything. All you need to know is it's a Windows Server 2003 box and the IP, okay, which um, we just had. So this, this, is, this is how thin... The, the barrier is to protecting yourself if, if you're in these situations, okay? So uh, it's not good. And like as if it wasn't bad enough, okay? Like your business is hosed. You've, you're dealing with threat actors, like criminals basically. Um, you're, you're turning patients away. Insult to injury, according to the HIPAA um, rule, um, or, the, you know, the definition of HIPAA, uh, I believe, uh, under the High Tech Act, is that a breach con is constituted by the acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of PHA. Well, guess what? 
I mean, nowadays they're straight up copying the data off, but even before when they were just encrypting it locally, they're acquiring your data and encrypting it. They have control of it. You do not. That makes it a, a reportable HIPAA breach. And if you get more than 500 patient records in a breach, you have to publicly report it to HHS Office of Civil Rights. You have to put it in the local media. You've got to notify everybody that was affected, which costs money. I mean, it's it's not it's not a good situation, right? You definitely don't want you don't want a, a PHI breach in any situation. But um, because somebody got on and ransomware your stuff, it's not good. So what does it look like? So this is, I, I just wanted to take a few minutes and actually show you like what it looks like when ransomware is executing, okay? Because it's not like it just happens magically in the background. Like it's very in your face um, because they want you to know that your machine is ransomware. Now this is the WannaCry one. There's, there's tons and tons of variants of um, ransomware, like, you know, 50 or 60 different versions. This is a, ran wait, hold on one second, I'm sorry. This is the WannaCry one. And you can see a couple things here. One, they explain to you what happened. Two, they tell you what you need to do to get your files back. Three, they explain how to get Bitcoin if you don't already have it or understand what it is. And some of these organizations, this is no joke, they literally have hired call centers, which is a completely legitimate business, and train them in handling uh, helping people walk through getting a Bitcoin wallet and transitioning their money into Bitcoin so they can pay this. So <laughs> the customer service level is top notch, uh, but the reason is because they don't want that to be a barrier to you paying them. Okay. Now they've increased, they've added some classic cyber threat actor uh, mechanisms here where they are instilling a sense of urgency. Okay. So first of all, uh, like I said, this is three hundred dollar. Um, Ransom, which is super cheap, right? This is not even, this is from 2017. You're not going to get a $300 ransom nowadays, unfortunately. Well, you shouldn't get ransomed anyways, but $300 would be like, you're definitely not getting that. Anyways, they have a countdown timer. So like while you're stressing and sweating about what happened and what should you do, there's a timer ticking down. And guess what? When it hits zero, the ransom's going to double. So now you've got like this added stress. Like you already don't want to pay it and it's going to cost twice as much. And then if you don't pay it a couple days later, they're just going to delete all your files and then you'll never get them. So this isn't really the case anymore uh, where they delete your files. Like they'll just go ahead and auction them or, or sell them to someone else, uh, like a competitor or, a, you know, a public, a public breach type thing. Um, so anyways, this, I just wanted to give you like, this is what it looks like. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, okay, so what does it look like on your computer, all right? So you've got the pop-up that says your stuff is screwed, right? So what does it look like to you? Well, they don't want to encrypt your operating system, which is the system of files that like, actually boots the computer up and allows you to kind of interact with it with a mouse and stuff like that. No. They want to encrypt just your data files, right? So you can see on the left here, um, this is your documents folder, and you can see all these file name, this file naming convention. This is all just encrypted uh, garbage, basically. You can see it over here, encrypted garbage, and they'll always drop a, a new file that has um, kind of what the instructions are. Uh, you can see here it's called Locky Recover for the Locky Ransomware. This one is a, a, a web page to show you like. Um, how to get your files back and stuff like that. They always drop that, usually on the desktop. But, um, so this is what it looks like. You could click on any of these files. And by the way, it's not just reserved to like data files, like your Windows um, Office files, like your PowerPoint and your Word. Like an executable, like your, um, like Microsoft Word itself, like the executable that you double click to launch it, that's just a file. It's a binary file, but it's a file. And they'll encrypt that. So like you lose your applications as well. That's why like your business is basically stopped uh, if you have a serious enough ransomware incident. Okay, I've just grabbed a couple more um, examples of like what the dropper file looks like. That's the file that kind of tells you what you need to do. Um, this one's having you go to a Tor browser, which is like basically getting on the dark web. Um, you know, so it shows you how to do that. 
Here's another one where they give you an email address on how to contact them to, to find out like, you know what, see this one's an interesting one. So like they don't tell you what your ransomware is here. They want you to contact them. That A will tell them that A, they've successfully uh, infected and ransomware someone. B, um, it'll allow them to determine what the ransomware ransom is at that point. Um, so it you know, gives them a little flexibility. There's been like a, a really interesting evolution of the ransomware threat actor the last like five or six years. But, um, and if you have backups, which is a great idea, um, right? Because if you're going to rebuild your system and not pay the ransom, um, you'll use your backups. Well, like surprise, surprise, threat actors caught on to that. So, uh, you know, the Xenos ransomware, it's just one example. There's several that will first delete your shadow backups or go find your backups. Uh, delete those, and then encrypt your hard drive and, and let you know that, by the way, they've done that, so don't go looking for them. Um, again, they're really just trying to twist your arm in order to uh, get you to want to pay that ransom. Okay, so this sounds bad, right? Jeez, like it sounded bad at the beginning. Now that you've seen it, it's awful. The fact that you can just like basically Google and find targets it's, it leaves a pit in your stomach, but what can we do to prevent it? And this is, this is you know, the gems, if you will, um, for you to take away uh, from this talk. So first and foremost, patch and update your systems. I know it sounds trivial and it sounds so obvious, but you would be stunned at how many people do not do this, how many organizations do not do this, or don't do it consistently, right? There's this thing in my industry called the Defender's Dilemma. I have to defend all the doors. The attacker only has to find one that I didn't defend. If you patch your systems, but you only patch like a third of them, that's good, but it's not great. You're, you're still increasing your attack surface unnecessarily. Running Windows 7 boxes because you don't want to pay for new licenses. Well, you can't patch them anymore. I'm sorry. Um, I wish you know, budgeted for it, but you got to be careful. But now you just know um, that that is a potential target. Uh, even that Windows Server 2003 we saw earlier, I mean, that's, that's not a good situation. So patch, patch, patch. Patching has to be critical. And uh, if you can only patch a little bit, then patch the most important ones. Different patches have different level of criticality, so patch the important ones, especially the security ones. And it's not just the operating system, right? So patch Windows, patch your Mac. Yeah, okay. Well, you need to patch things like uh, your web browsers, right? So you use Chrome, you use Safari, Firefox, what have you. Those need to be updated independent of themselves. Updating the operating system does not update everything, okay? It, you have to manage your own applications. Um, you know, Adobe for a while was a really uh, targeted one. It still is, like Adobe Reader, Adobe Acrobat. Make sure those are patched. Java, if you're running that. ActionScript, Flash Player. Um, these are all common attack targets of compromising a machine. Again, we talked about it before. Um, they don't need to know your username and password. They can just like exploit your computer and make it do something it wasn't really designed to do. Okay, so patch your systems. Ask your IT people to patch their systems. Patch your own home systems. Patch your phones, your tablets. How do I prevent ransomware? Well, multi-factor is a good one. Multi-factor, so patching and multi-factor are the two most important controls you can put in your organization to protect you from most threats, cyber threats. Not just ransomware, but they're very important. Multi-factor authentication, while it adds a little bit of uh, inconvenience to you, when you log into something, especially cloud-based apps, like your you know, Gmail, your financials, QuickBooks, your all scripts if you're using third-party EHR, whatever. Username and password, and then you get challenged for something else, a six-digit pin, a text message, a fingerprint, whatever. This second factor is critical. I can't tell you. I literally can't tell you. But let me assure you, there have been multiple times where because multi-factor was in place, massive problems didn't happen. The reason is... Remember we talked earlier about phishing and getting your username and password, tricking you? You use the same password across systems, you, your LinkedIn, your email, your EHR, your work password. They're all the same, so it's easy to remember. Well, guess what? LinkedIn gets hacked. 
Bad guys are smart. They have scripts and quick automated tools that will then start scanning popular cloud-based applications to see if the username and password work on those. And a lot of times they do. So if you have multi-factor on, it doesn't matter if they have your password. They can't get in. Multi-factor is good. I, I won't, yeah, you should definitely have multi-factor on your email. This is as, as an aside. Because if they go to your, um, they go somewhere and it's got multi-factor and you do, oh, just let me reset my password because I forgot my, uh, or I lost my phone and I don't have access to my two-factor, which is a true use case. Um, if they have access to your email, uh, then they can start resetting your passwords and stuff like that. I, I always tell people as individual private citizens, not just as businesses, uh, to put multi-factor on your financials, banking, and um, on your email. Okay, back to ransomware. Another option uh, is putting a VPN in place. So we talked earlier about RDPing into your organization, which is a terrible practice, okay? People do it all the time. But like RDP wasn't designed, RDP was designed for administering your own network within your network. It wasn't designed as like an externally accessible remote access point into your network. VPNs, virtual private networks, are how you do it securely, right? So VPN, you initially establish a trusted connection to your network from your house or um, Starbucks or whatever. Then you go across that and access systems, okay? And that VPN, threat actors don't have access to it. They can't scan, they could scan and see the uh, terminal point of your VPN, but they can't do anything with it, assuming you patch. Remember, we, we talked about patching before, you got to keep that patched. Uh, but this is the way to do it. Uh, EDR, I won't spend a lot of time on this. If you don't have a security staff at your organization, you're probably not going to do EDR. You could outsource it. But basically, like, when there's an incident, someone's running malware on their computer by accident or they're going to a suspicious website, um, endpoint detection and response is kind of like antivirus. It'll quarantine the malware. Uh, it'll notify people. This is why you need security staff. Uh, but... Uh, just just be aware that this is a great control and it'll help stop ransomware. So like ransomware, the way it works is like starts executing and it goes right down the stack, right? File one encrypt, file two encrypt, file three encrypt. Well, EDR, endpoint detection response, will say file one encrypt. They're like, whoa, 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 this looks like ransomware. Destroy that process. And, you know, that's how it works. So this is a good option. Email gateway. And, and I'm doing rapid fire, but I'm assuming that you'll be able to pause and go back or whatever. So, um, plus I get super excited when I talk about this stuff. Email gateway. So when your email comes in, if you have access to an email gateway, um, like Office 365 does this natively, Microsoft does it, but you could own something. I, I don't want to name any particular vendors uh, in order to avoid um, vendor bias. But if, if you have an email gateway, it can come in like your email comes in and that email gateway provider has a threat intel coming from everywhere and they know that that email is malicious and they stop it in the tracks or they see that the attachment is malware and they rip it out and like or it never gets delivered to you. Email gateways are awesome because email is such a um, kind of initial attack vector into a beginning an attack. Um, as we showed earlier, it's the second most popular, especially for ransomware, uh, next to RDP. So email gateways are interesting. It's a technical solution, and it costs money. Uh, DNS, you could change your DNS provider. Um, you know, this is this is more technical. Uh, but basically, the, what DNS is, is like when you type in Google.com, it's not like the, the Internet and the way networks work care about Google.com. They use IP addresses. And DNS basically translates Google.com into um, an IP address, right? So it's like it's like having like a restaurant name versus the address of the restaurant, right? Like you wouldn't say like, oh, I'm going to 24 Main Street. No, you'd say like, oh, we're going down to, um, you know, the Roost or we're going down to this restaurant, right? So like this is how DNS works. But when you do it, um, a lot of people right now probably um, – you know, if you have a smaller practice and you have like Comcast or Verizon doing your internet, um, they'll do your DNS resolution. That's something that they do, but they're not adding any value or threat intelligence um, to that. So if you click on a malicious link in an email, they'll be glad to resolve that that um, that address to an IP and send you there. But there are DNS service providers like Quad9, and this is free. 
where they do have a little bit of threat intel. And if you click on something that's going to take you somewhere malicious, um, they will stop you. Okay, so, the, so the, the next slide is about adding a header to your... Um, adding a header to your emails. And I don't, I don't want to show the slide because uh, there's, some, there's an email address of an SCM GMA mem member who I was interfacing with to set this talk up. Uh, but since this is going to be a publicly internet accessible talk, I do not want to um, disclose that in this talk. So just if you've ever seen a header, you can set this once and forget it. Uh, but basically, if an email comes in from outside your organization, it will append a... Um, a header up top that says like caution this is coming from an external source or be careful this didn't come from an internal because what threat actors will do is they will send emails and look like it's coming from internal like hey it's it's the CIO hey it's the CEO I need you to do this really quick uh, I don't have time for you to ask questions I'm getting on a plane it needs to be done by the time I land uh, but if it came from an external then you would know that this is totally uh, rubbish and that you don't need to pay attention um, to it so I actually have a link uh, I have a video, a YouTube video on my channel that I will um, uh, point to or whatever. Uh, actually, I'll probably have like a little drop down, drop up here that shows you exactly how to create this um, header uh, in your emails within an Office 365 environment. But the process would be pretty much the same uh, regardless of where you go. Okay, so let's skip that side. Okay, another great example uh, or good idea is having fully separate guest wireless if you're going to offer that, say you have a waiting room at your practice or whatever, you just have like a guest wireless where you have like untrusted users getting on, having that completely separated, you absolutely should not have them on your business wireless network. Uh, but having it as a, like a separate VLAN, um, that's okay. That's not great. Um, I mean, if they were really motivated and technically capable, they could jump over that. So if you have a separate, separate guest wireless that is an excellent way to prevent someone from kind of like getting onto your network um, if they were physically within proximity. But, you know, if you think in the city, if you think in kind of um, shopping malls with it, or shopping centers where there's like a lot of people kind of stacked together, um, that could be a potential um, attack vector. So training. Training is huge. Uh, this, is, this is something, among other things, that uh, Coastal does offer. Um, but you can get it in various various places. Even taking this training right now is training. Uh, but train your staff. Train them what a fish looks like. Train them uh, to be savvy about like what criminals are thinking and or what cyber criminals how they're acting and what their attacks are like and what they could um, suspect. Like don't pick up a thumb drive that you found in the parking lot and stick it into a computer. Don't do that. Okay. Don't uh, plug your, your, your phone directly into a, a charger that you don't recognize, like at the airport. Like, I mean, these are slightly uh, more obscure attack vectors, but they're real. And if your staff doesn't know about it, teach your staff, keep their systems updated and patched. I mean, there, there's a ton of stuff that training will help so significantly um, in thwarting because there's a whole technique called social engineering where you're attacking the human um, of the, the, the of the process instead of ta attacking the technology and training is pretty much the most effective way of reducing the risk and kind of uh, de defanging the effectiveness of social engineering. Um, and also even at CISA.gov, which is a, um, um, a subsidiary or whatever, like a department within the Department of Homeland Security, they have a, um, you know, they recognize healthcare as a critical infrastructure, which means you have access to some services that they provide. Um, they can do vulnerability scanning, pen testing, right? They can fish your own employees. The, the link is here. Um, I have tried to contact them. I've had um, moderate success. Um, you know, it takes some time for them to respond to you and stuff like that. This is similar services that uh, Coastal offers. Uh, except, you know, you get faster responses. So anyways, just know, and this is free, by the way, this is free. So if, if, if financials are concerned, if budget isn't really there for this season, FY21, FY22, um, you can get access to this and they will help you, okay? Cyber insurance, uh, I won't spend a ton of time on this. Cyber insurance is pretty popular right now. It's very, very affordable for the amount of coverage you get. Um, basically, I assume you have business insurance. You very likely have malpractice insurance if you're a provider. Um, cyber, there are riders for those insurance 
policies that you can get cyber on, um, talk to your insurance um, coverage person or you know your agent and find out if cyber's in there, find out if you can add it. It's like pennies on the dollar to get coverage for cyber and this will cover things. I mentioned earlier, cyber incidents, not just ransomware, but cyber incidents are not cheap. They can be very expensive and ransomware particularly is nasty. Uh, and there's like uh, legal fees, there's uh, credit monitoring, um, you know, some patients might sue you uh, for your inability to protect their information. That's been well known. Uh, there's a whole PR spin firm. You got to open a, um, you have to take a, open a call center uh, to handle uh, affected patients' uh, questions. So there's a ton of fees, and, and insurance will help you mitigate the the financial impact. Um, uh, there are ISACs, which are basically information sharing. You can get threat intel. Again, I don't. This is like less for the business, less for the non-technical audience, but uh, knowing that these exist gets you access to beginning to kind of get your finger on the pulse of what um, what is going on, what's the current threat. And, and I got to tell you, in cybersecurity, things are rapidly moving, right? I mean, it was just a few years ago, ransomware didn't exist, and now it's like a, you know, tens of billions of dollar problem and I mean, it, it came it came up rapidly, and, and I know a few years might seem like a long time, but I mean, e even the, the just ran, just encrypting your stuff to auctioning it to uh, publicly embarrassing you, I mean, that all ramped up very quickly in a short amount of time. So um, you know, you can use these things to kind of stay abreast of what's the situation. Um, disable SMB v1. I'll just leave that there. Uh, ask your IT people if you have SMB v1 running in your environment to, to disable it. That just you should. Okay, so we feel a little bit better. We, we've got some controls now. We know how to at least manage the risk of a ransomware incident, if not, you know, mitigate it to acceptable levels. We've got staff trained. We've got systems configured properly and updated. But, you know, it sometimes it rains. So what happens if ransomware strikes your organization? What do you do? Okay, after your initial freakout is completed, because you're going to freak out, Be aware, it's going to cost you, as I've mentioned multiple times now, the average expense is about 60 grand. You will be infected or impacted for about a week. So, so be prepared for, for that uh, consequence and impact to your business. Um, and I think this was in Alabama, oops, excuse me. I think this was in Alabama. Uh, three hospitals had to turn all their patients away. Not all of them. I guess most critical got to stay. But like for the most part, business operations, clinical operations sh shut down. So you, you got to be prepared for this. I mean, it, it's it sucks. I mean, if you have um, downtime procedures, um, that's great. Go on to paper. Um, you might be able to do it. Uh, you may not have access to the systems, though, that you need in order to do downtime. Right. Like you could do everything on paper, but maybe you know, um, a medical device that is needed to help, you know, deliver patient care isn't available. So just, just be aware that it can be bad, but on average, it's going to be about a week and it's going to cost you 60 grand. Disconnect that system from the network. Okay. This is really what you should do first and foremost, either disable the Wi-Fi, um, rip the cord out or, you know, carefully unplug it. The machine that is ransomware in itself may not be salvageable, right? If you had some of those tools like the endpoint detection and response that's going to um, stop it in its tracks, good. Uh, some ransomware is actually a little bit more complicated where they'll initially drop like what's called the dropper uh, on your computer and then that dropper will go out to the internet and pull down an actual um, the ransomware tool so, I mean, if you disconnect it from the internet uh, or from the network, you, you kind of stop that from, from successfully occurring. You'd have to catch it quick. But um, really the reason that you want to disconnect it is so that it can infect other machines on your network. Ransomware, not always, but often will um, want to spread, right? Because they want to significantly impact you. They don't want you to just be like, oh, this laptop's encrypted. Let's go get another laptop. They want to be like, oh, my entire business is encrypted, right? So... Excuse me. So that's why you want to get it off the network. 
Make sure you have backups. This sounds so like 1995, but listen, make sure you have backups and more importantly, make sure that you test them, you verify them, and if you can, take them off site, like not on your network and not like not physically there, right? I mean, that's the best practice anyways, because if your building burns down, you want to have access to your data, but that's a different point. So I've, I know so many times, like so many times, where you ask the IT person, you guys do backups? Oh, yeah, we do backups. Okay, like, have you ever tested them? Oh, you know, like occasionally we'll, uh, we'll bring a file in or something like that, where it's like some, you know, differential backup where it's just like a small sliver or something like that. And then come to find out, like, the backup system that's doing, like, the main backups, um, it, 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 was, it was full in some cases, or if it was taped, the tapes had broke, and it hadn't actually been doing backups for months. Um, like, it, technology breaks, and if it's, like, something that you set it and you just assume it works, um, you're taking a risk there. So, like, make sure that you do it. It's, it's a pain in the butt to fully restore your environment. It's a pain in the butt. But if you did it once a year, I mean, that's better than nothing. If you did it a couple times a year, that'd be better. The point is, when, when, that, when, the, when the house is on fire is not when you want to find out that the fire extinguisher doesn't work, right? So just backups are so critical. It, like, basically, they're what protects you if you get ransomware and you don't want to pay the ransom. Oh, and by the way, I didn't even say this yet. When you when you get ransomware and the ransom's $1,000, say, right? Today, current day, 2020, you have a 50-50 chance of even getting the decryption keys. So there's no honor among thieves. So, like, it's quite possible, coin flip, they ransomware you, you're in dire straits, you pay the, you know, 50 grand, 100 grand, whatever, and then that's the last you see of them. And, and the money is untraceable. That's why they want crypto, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. I mean, you can kind of trace it. The FBI has done some. But for the most part, you can't go get it back. You can't reverse the wire transfer, right? The, the money's gone. So just back, take backups. I guess that's what I'm saying. Take your backups. And, you know, call the FBI your insurance company, possibly, depending on what your angle is. Your insurance company, if you have cyber insurance, then they've got an entire playbook that they're going to execute on when you call them and say you have ransomware. They'll, they have these people called breach coaches who basically will base, who will be your like quarterback for handling the incident, for interfacing with the, um, the threat actor. If you decide to pay the ransom, for, for paying the ransom, um, you know, basically you'll have a experienced champion in your corner if your insurance company offers that. You can also call a cybersecurity company, um, as I've mentioned, like Coastal, uh, and, and, you know, they can help you, we can help you um, d walk through and deal with that, whether you're going to pay them or not. And then the FBI, they obviously want to know about this too, and they can help you as well. I mean, it is a crime. You're being victimized. And oftentimes by an international threat actor. So, I mean, it's very, very relevant that the FBI would be, um, it would be in their jurisdiction. And, and you really got to make, I mean, you should probably think of this beforehand. Like at your next like owner's meeting or your next senior leadership meeting or what, what have you, you should really have this conversation. Do you pay the ransomware? I mean, do you pay the ransom and hope you get the keys back? Or do you rebuild? Some people don't want to pay the ransom. They say it's funding terror. Some people do want to pay the ransom because they don't have backups. And it is critical for the success of their business because they can barely make rent. And COVID screwed them up. And now they're just back on their feet. And they can't have seven days and $60,000 worth of pain. So, I mean, it's really situational dependent on whether you pay it or not, or whether you rebuild or not, whether you can rebuild or not. Uh, but this is a conversation that you can do ahead of time. Hopefully, hopefully you're never, ever a victim of ransomware. Uh, but the trend 
would suggest that at least one person watching this will be a victim of ransomware. So you have the blueprints to protect your business. You know what ransomware is now. You know how it can get into your organization, RDP, email, misconfigured network devices. You know what to do to reduce or eliminate the risk altogether. Don't do RDP. Done. That entire attack vector is gone. Patch your systems. Train your users. You don't need to be a victim of ransomware, but just know that the amount of the attacks are going up and the likelihood of you becoming a victim are higher. So don't be a victim. Do what you can. And, um, you know, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Best of luck to you. Uh, like I said at the beginning, if you want to talk more to me about this uh, in any capacity, a personal, a professional, a business relationship way, uh, reach out to me. Uh, I love talking about this stuff. I understand it quite well. And, um, you know, thank you for your time.